Well, good afternoon and welcome um, to today's webinar on the art of valuing startups. I'm Peter Haley, a director in the Forensic Services Division here at Vincent's, and I'm joined by John Thine, who's also a director. Good afternoon. So that's just our normal disclaimer there. Sorry for the pauses. I'm just trying to work technology and that never goes well with me. That's us in our contact details. If you uh, feel the need to, uh, after this presentation, if you've got any questions or anything, please feel free to contact either John or myself. So what we're basically covering today is, you know, is this valuation an art or a science? What are the differences to valuing um, startups to valuing established businesses? What are the, some of the methodologies that we use to value startups? And finally, we'll finish with three case studies to uh, illustrate where different methodologies can be used in different circumstances. And part of what we're doing today is just touching on some of these issues. Obviously, in half an hour, there's a limited amount of information we can cover in that time. Um, however, what we really want to get to is that we do need to, although valuation is very similar in this space, um, there's also a lot of other factors that come into play. So is it an art or is it a science? Um, first of all, I think we should just talk about exactly what is a startup. So make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So it's a new or in some cases, it's even a potential business. There isn't even a business there yet, it's just an idea. Um, normally, they're forecast to be fast growing. Uh, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, typically, they aim to fill a hole of some sort by offering either a new product or a unique product or a process or a service that may or may not have made it to the market yet. So it may be an improvement on an existing um, idea or it may be a totally new idea. Um, and most commonly, they're still overcoming problems and being developed and, and have no track record as yet. Um, or if they do, it's, it's very, uh, very minor. So is it an art or a science? And this is the same question you can ask when you're doing any sort of business valuation. Um, you've got to ask what exactly, you know, what are we trying to do? So the purpose of any valuation is to determine what something is worth. And how do we define that? In a business valuation context, that definition on the screen there is the most common one, where we've got a price that's negotiated in an open and unrestricted market between knowledgeable, willing, but not anxious buyers and sellers acting at arm's length. So in theory, if you don't have all of those um, factors, you don't have a market value. And what you'll find in valuing startups a lot of the time is in fact, um, you don't have necessarily all those things. So it's, it's um, questionable whether you are actually can determine a market value a lot of the time. Um, so an alternative definition where well, you could consider when you don't have all those factors is what are the future cash flows? And then discount that back to the present value at a rate that reflects the risk of the cash flows. So the factor of the future cash flow, so included in cash flow, so Notice we say their cash flows and not profit because especially with a startup, you've often got a lot of developed costs. Uh, CapEx means capital expenditure. So they might need to uh, spend, a, if it's a new piece of equipment, there might be substantial tooling up, for example, that needs to be done to produce the product that they're going to produce. And then the risk factor. And obviously with a startup, you've got um, more risk in terms of its unproven um, factors there. And then is it being valued to the market? Refer back to the previous slide and the market definition there, or is it to what we'll call a punter, someone who's prepared to take a bit of a punt uh, in the hope that it may or may not come off. And so is it truly value where it's being determined or is it price? And price is, I'll come to that in a second. So as I said, all valuations are really a mixture of art and science, and not all the elements affecting a valuation are contained in the financial statements, uh, even where you have an established business, which John will talk about a little later. Um, but that's certainly the case with a startup. In fact, most of the elements affecting the valuation won't be contained in the financial statements. Um, 
and you only get to know those by you know kicking the tires that were talking to the directors talking to the um, the developer of the concept um, what's their vision what's their management experience have they ever brought a product to market before have they ever gone through the the highs and the lows of, of uh, trying to raise capital and it's always important to remember when you're doing evaluation there is always a range now typically a report lands on a number because um, a range is not a lot of use to a lot of people a lot of the time but just remember that um, hard to say what the rule of thumb is but probably when you read evaluation report the range may be plus or minus 10 percent of what the report says and especially with a startup we've got outcomes that are depending on a future which cannot be predicted all we can do is give it our best shot so generally speaking where you've got a startup there's a lot more art involved whereas if you have a late stage company that's um, been around for 10 20 years producing things has customers has staff um, has profits it's more science because you have more documentation to fall back on mm. and and it's very important in, in what we do is to try to actually understand the um, dynamics behind the forecast information we, we look at and um, so I'm saying forecast information because in the startup space it's normally what we're relying upon um, it's that old adage that if you actually give um, positive numbers in a financial forecast you'll come up with a positive answer um, but from a reality viewpoint is it always going to be positive so we need to actually fully understand what's going in on into the actual financial statements or the forecasts but we also be, need to be um, very careful not to overstep our marks. Quite often in this area, we're not experts in the um, product that we're actually looking at and that the whole um, uh, forecasts are based around. We need to make sure that we are not actually extending ourselves past that level of expertise. The next section is what we want to do is actually revisit um, some of the concepts we look at when we're actually talking about a, a normal business valuation, see where they apply in, in a, a startup valuation. And as you'd expect, most of them are the same, um, but we actually have probably additional things to think about once we actually get into um, the startup phase. So going back to the, that second definition that, that Peter talked about, um, what is valuation? Essentially, we're trying to work out what something's worth and we actually do look at it, we're actually looking at a price or a value, depending on what the actual scope of our engagement is. But any value um, for a business is essentially represented by its future cash flows given the risk that's there. So what we're trying to work out, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're trying to work out is what are those future cash flows? What's the risk of those cash flows occurring? Um, and trying to work out a present value to what's there. So a significant amount of work needs to go into um, not necessarily how that discounted cash flow looks, but more about what's the, the actual um, uh, integrity of the numbers we're relying upon in that forecast information. With any business valuation we look at, there are three primary areas that we look at. The profitability, as Peter said before, the profitability and cash flow. Cash flow is, in this case, probably more important than profitability, although one does stem to the other. So the profitability cash flow, the risk associated around those forecast, that forecast information, as well as the actual business that's there. Um, and the third area, <clears throat> excuse me, is that net core um, assets relying upon, so the infrastructure needed in the business. So if we look at the first one, the uh, profitability and cash flow, now there's a little dial of um, things there that some of the things we look at. We're, again, we're coming back to what's actually the drivers behind profitability and cash flow. The important thing here is we're looking at the future, not the past. Now in a business valuation, we do look at the past as a proxy for the future, but we have a track record, and that's always the first place to start. What's the track record? Where are we today? Where are we like to be in the future? When we're looking at a startup, we don't have that track record. So we're actually looking, trying to actually assess where we're we going into the future without any track record. So obviously it adds a level of risk and a level of integrity we need to actually look at. Um, as I said, past is not necessarily the future. In a startup, we don't have that past. Um, in a business valuation, we're basically saying, here is the past, now what's changed going into the future? Again, with the forecasted information, we have no past to assess that on. So we're relying on representations and information that we can get in a marketplace 
that if it's a new product, where is that information coming from? What could change? Again, um, we're looking for forecast information, so we don't have a track record, but we are looking at here also, here's the forecast information, we're doing it from today, but what factors can actually make that cash flow or, or profitability change into the future? Um, an example might be, um, we've developed a, a some form of trading platform for a business, we're about to launch into it, um, the business looks very viable, uh, we've got clients that are thinking it's fantastic, and in a year's time, a competitor comes on board with a, a competing platform. How valid are our, for, is our forecasted information? And that's probably something you often see with startups and their, their forecasts. They, they predict they're going to grow here, here, here and here, but rarely do I ever see any of them factoring in the competition. They always assume that no, no one else will see what they're doing and, and, and try and uh, make a copycat of it. So um, that's something to be aware of. You know, the market size may be a certain size, but you may not have 100% of that market to yourself the whole time. And it's just a question of when will the competitors start to arrive? I've got a bit of a pessimistic view when it comes to that, that um, if you've got a niche that makes a lot of money, other people are going to try to actually get into that niche. The forecasted normalised profit, where again, this forecast information, what is actually the likely um, realistic uh, way going forward. Uh, one thing that we actually often look at, we get provided with forecasted information, but then actually doing sensitivity analysis around that forecasted information. What if we we're, we're pegged and it actually does 10% or 20% more? What if instead of getting 50 customers, we get 60 customers? Or alternatively, we get 30 customers or 10 customers, and it takes three years instead of one year? How would that actually affect the forecast? And then actually, how would that actually affect the value? So doing that sensitivity analysis and then probably putting a probability analysis around that forecasted information um, can quite often sort of start narrowing down uh, where, with, where the actual value should be sitting. Moving on from the profit, we're looking at cash flow. What effect, what factors are affecting cash flow? We've started with the profit. We're all interested in how much money do we take home at the end of the day? So how do we convert that profit through to distributions from that business? So we're looking at how much um, working capital the business needs, what the change in working capital is going to be, what the actual level of capital expenditure is going to be moving forward, and what the changes might be in that area. One area that's often not looked at, particularly in that startup area, is look at the cash flows the business are generating. But for the whole level of the, the actual um, establishment of that business, the owners aren't factoring in their own efforts. Um, so they're not putting in a commercial wage for themselves. And at a point, they're going to need to. Um, from a valuation viewpoint, we need to look at that now. Um, so what is actually what is actually a commercial remuneration for the business? When's that going to actually start kicking in? Um, and then we get back to future focus and that wheel continues to go around. The next one, which is numbers are obviously extremely important, but actually understanding the industry that's there and the actual um, the risks associated, again, are extremely important. Um, the risks that are there come from anything and opportunities. It's both both those factors, but usually the opportunities are already reflected in the numbers. So now we're actually looking at the risks associated with those numbers, but also with the actual industry itself. And they come from everywhere. Economic and industry, we can't control those. We've got key employees um, and skills they provide, whether it be the principals, whether it be actual key staff. The financial side of it, how's it going to be funded? Um, what requirements are there for the funding, what's the profitability that's there, the cash flow side of it, um, moving into the operational side, the logistics, how's the product going to be delivered, have we got the systems to actually carry that forward, what needs to actually um, change in those systems, um, do we need operational software to actually um, kick in at certain levels along the way, um, what competition's going to be out there, what um, uh, replacement uh, products could be out there, the size of the business, what changes over time. Those factors there we're looking at for our normal business. Are we looking at, old, at different factors when we actually come to a startup? My view is, and I think Peter, you share this view, is that there shouldn't be any additional things we're looking at. We're just considering things that are a lot more uh, in depth. All of these factors we should be looking at with our normal valuations. What is the niche? The niche, just defining what that niche is, is someone likely to come in? Are there alternative products? Are there likely to be alternative products coming in? Um, 
and we've seen that within Australia and outside of Australia, there's just a myriad of things that are happening um, and the world's getting a lot smaller. Um, is it proven technology? Um, what needs to be done? Is it reliable technology? Is it technology that is actually standalone and stable? Or does it need continued improvement, and therefore continued investment? Will future technology change things? Um, one of the things that's often sort of glossed over is what's the demand for the product? Um, it's a great idea, but do people actually really want to, do people really want that product now and into the future at the price that's there? Um, and Peter's looking at a couple now that may or may not not fly the couple of examples we have at the end. Again, they're, they're all extremely viable businesses on paper, but the reality with two out of the three of the ones we're about to talk about is the business struggle and continues to struggle in that the, the, um, the dollars are there, it's generating a client base, it's generating a cash flow, um, but that cash flow is being sucked up by further development. And is that demand going to continue to grow or are we actually losing our opportunity um, in reinvesting that at a point we're actually going to have a declining business and need to get those returns? At what point do you actually have your break even point? Um, how much sales do you need to actually break even from an operational viewpoint? And then on top of that, a investment viewpoint with further development, the capital side. Um, what is the market size? You know, often we hear the um, you know, we hope to get 1% of the market. Is 1% of the market realistic? Does 1% of the market require a product like what you're actually delivering? The capital expenditure and, and future development costs is, is utmost important what we're looking at. And as accountants, um, we tend to look at the profit and loss. Our experience doesn't take us necessarily into the capital expenditure requirements or development requirements of a specific product but we need to lend our mind as to what may be required. Um, and in quite often we see with these um, uh, startups, the funding, the actual cash burn that's required, it's profitable, but it's still burning cash faster than it's coming in. And therefore future cash flows, uh, cash raisings are required, fundraising are required, or the business just will stop. The next one's just a little bit of a shorter one, the third factor third um, driver there is those sort of core assets. What the working capital requirement is, so as the business continues to expand, it's going to continue to expand its working capital requirements. So they're going to be things like your stock, your work in progress, your consumable hold, your, um, uh, your debtors, they're all going to continue to expand as will your operating um, costs that are there. But again, with the infrastructure side, as we grow, um, what additional infrastructure will we require? Um, so we go from uh, 10 employees to 50 employees. We can put the expense in there, but what about the additional computers, desks, um, a larger premises, different location, moving, um, fit out, all of those types of things on top of equipment we're going to require, capital equipment, what are the requirements that are there? So those three factors are uh, you know, obviously the guts of what we look at. I'll just gloss over this one. It's a lesser importance, but when we're actually doing it, we need to make sure we know and define what's the purpose of evaluation. Are we doing it historical? Are we doing it now? Are we doing it at a future point in time? The date of that valuation, um, what it's going to be used for, the standard of value, or is it price? So are we actually valuing this to the marketplace, um, or are we actually valuing it to investor coming on board? Um, what is being valued? Are we actually valuing a platform, IP, a product, a process, or a business, or an entity? Finding exactly where we're actually going there. Um, for instance, are we taking into account debt? Are we taking into account repayment of funding? And what's our role? Um, are we independent? Are we acting for the party, trying to assist them in actually producing forecasts? What are we actually doing in this process? Okay, so we'll go on now to um, some valuation methodologies we use to, to value startups. So starting with you know, some of the traditional methodologies that we use for established businesses. So, um, and I'll go through these in a bit more detail. So there's discounted cash flow, um, book value, liquidation value, I think called relief from royalty or capitalized profits. So the first one of those is the um, discounted cash flow. 
So that's what we were talking about earlier in terms of, you know, what are the ca cash flows that expected to come from this um, business or idea. Um, often with a startup, you might do a, you know, a high, medium and low probabilities of, of various um, ranges of cash flows. So to do this, we need to determine the future cash flows, which we spoke about previously, you know, which is not just the operating expenses and income, hopefully. Uh, tax, if you've got that, that might not be a problem for a while if you're not making profits just yet. Um, what are the um, cash flows you need for to further development of the, is it pretty well set and right to go or are you going to spend a lot more money developing this thing and constantly fine tuning it? Uh, as John said just before, all the capital expenditure and then also the financing. And, and the last thing is the discount rate, which is reflective of the risks of the business. So obviously with a startup, you're looking at discount rates that are substantially higher uh, in terms of compared to an established business that has a track record. Second of the traditional methodologies is a book value, which essentially records what it cost. The theory here is that someone would potentially buy what you've got at the moment and knowing you've spent a million dollars to get to where you are, they think, well, rather than reinvent the wheel, we'll just pay what you've spent and we'll be in the same boat. Um, it's a pretty basic sort of valuation methodology. With a lot of these methodologies, what we find is it's it's relevant to actually apply several. Um, so, for instance, the, the, the cost methodology, it has merit, but it also has a lot of downfall. Um, so we need to actually use that and consider as a, as a, a value, a, an approach, it has a level of relevance. And then looking at the other ones alongside. So although you may have spent a million dollars to get to where you are now, if you tried to sell off, what you actually got in terms of tangible parts, you know, you might have a bit of equipment, you might have some IP with a patent or something that might have some value. Um, in a liquidation, in a sell-off, you may not get anything like the amount of, that you've spent to date. And then moving away from the traditional methodologies, when you've, um, in startups, there's been a few I mentioned there the Berkus, the risk factor summation, scorecard and venture capital, uh, some rule of thumb methodologies that have been developed over um, by various people over time. Um, the first three of those, basically the Berkus risk factor and summation and scorecard, they all measure the startup against various criteria. And the thing they need though is each of those measures tends to be quite subjective a lot of the time and often requires some sort of comparable startup as a base to compare to. So in Australia, that's often quite difficult. It's easier uh, for American valuers. There's a lot more startups and a lot more publicly available information. But um, so what you find most commonly we find is the use specifically for startups is the venture capital methodology. And that um, is more based around the return the investor requires. So it's, it's not looking at um, cash flows necessarily it is to some extent because it's referenced to the expected value so a venture capitalist will often come in and expect to you know, get out get in get out in five years time so when the venture capitalist expects to exit and also factoring in there might be further capital raisings down the track which will dilute their interest um, if that happens so the in this example we've said there they've done some cash flows and worked out in five years time, this particular business might be worth $10 million. So if they want a five times return on their money over that five years, they'll say, well, for 50%, we'll put in a million dollars today because we think our 50% share will be worth 5 million in five years time. So again, it's um, there's often a bit of horse trading in terms of what really happens is the, the existing owner requires X amount of cash to keep the thing going. Um, the venture capitalist knows if they take 50% or more, the existing owner will probably not be as incentivized as they would be if they had a majority share. And again, allowing for dilution down the track. So there's often that sort of weighing up between how much money the, the startup needs to keep going um, versus keeping the interest of, of the uh, the founder. So just on that one, um, I just want to draw the, the, the comparison there to what market value might be. So here we'll have in this example here, an investor's put in a million dollars. 
or a half share interest. So it might value it up just on that basis at $2 million today. Um, this is for a business that probably hasn't started trading yet, has no clients, has no proven track record, um, probably won't hit the market for another year. Um, so we're looking at the, unless it gets that million dollars, this business will shut down. So from market value point of view, what's it worth based on where it is today? Um, with someone investing, suddenly it starts getting value, but without that investment, this probably isn't, isn't actually anywhere. So that the, um, the venture capitalist really is investing in this today really for a punt and he's probably investing in 10 or 20 of these things um, and a couple of them will come off and they'll come off really well but they expect that that's the level of risk they're looking at and 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 that five times return on their money is not really specific to this business they're not saying i want a 20 percent return because of the risk involved in this business they just have that benchmark in terms of what they expect to get as a return so I'll just do a couple of examples to finish off. So the first one um, was a new player trying to break into what was previously a monopolistic industry. Um, so it's been established about five years now. Um, we were first involved about three years ago when it had raised $5 million from some private investors, you know, the half a dozen people who'd each kicked in some money. And that was the amount um, it needed a further, sorry, it had um, burnt $10 million to date at three years ago. Uh, that's what they managed to raise in capital from the original shareholders. Uh, it needed further funds to keep going in, until such time as it would be self-funding and would actually be operational. Um, and that's about now, as it turns out. So in the last 12 months, they've made substantial headway in getting the product into the market, um, have signed up their distribution channels, um, and the various you know, um, logistics they needed to, to get this thing going. Um, every year to date, the five years, it's had substantial losses and it's also had substantial negative cash flow in terms of development costs, but it's actually forecast to make a $2 million profit in calendar 2020. So in this one, when we first got involved three years ago, we um, it was really impossible to value under any sort of traditional methodology and what happened was with that $5 million being raised, it was that example I just gave in terms of it was just a bit of a, a negotiation between the funder and the existing shareholders. How much are you prepared to give up in your existing shareholding? You need our $5 million. We want X. Whereas now we can actually do a discounted cash flow because we've actually, um, you could say luckily for us in terms of doing the valuation, this thing had turned the corner this in, 2019 and, and as of now on a monthly basis it was making profits and you could see the growth happening so we were able to adopt a discounted cash flow methodology the next example is a earth moving higher concept um, now we actually had the opportunity to look at this on several several dates i might say this business has actually gone on and actually has done quite well um, since then but the business we first looked at it and then again, we looked at it about two years later. Um, the business is a what if type concept for earth moving equipment. Um, so it was designed to, with the sort of the reduction in the, the um, mining industry some time ago, um, to actually get utilization with it for people's equipment. Um, they put it on this higher type process. They, they plug all their details into the location, the type of equipment, the parameters, the age um, and the pricing. They put all that into a into a system and then a punter who actually wants to use it goes online puts in their parameters we want something in roma for this long this type of equipment and it'll it'll automatically generate a series of um, uh, essentially suppliers for that equipment great model um, the the revenue is generated on a subscriber basis a subscriber model where and the people actually putting their, their equipment up actually subscribe for the sensory listings. Um, this, the platform over this two year period we looked at, initially it was when we saw them, there were you know, three or four people sitting in a, a little warehouse um, and they're all sitting around a table working. Um, they had a couple of clients and it was really all about the future. And the forecasts at that stage were, were very positive. Um, at that's, that point we, approached on DCF type approach, discounted cash flow approach. Um, 
we only got our, our numbers to draft and then we had something change and we, we picked it up again two years later. Um, interestingly, in the, the, when we first looked at it, five years out, three to five years out, it was looking, it was going to rain money. Um, looking at it two years later, the business had expanded. They moved to far larger premises. They had 30 odd staff working for them. They had a lot more, uh, the revenues they were generating were, you know, several million dollars. Um, and you'd expand, which was sort of in line broadly with their operating targets. However, what wasn't in line with their, their targets, their forecasts, was the level of continued development they needed to actually do. Um, with the platform, they continued to develop it. They'd actually looked at different opportunities and they're trying to develop those opportunities. And as a result, this business was still burning significant amounts of cash. Um, with what was there, we actually had a little bit of history. So I'm sort of cheating as a startup. This business was still in its expansion phase, I guess, but it still hadn't produced a return. Um, at that stage, we would actually, I think we'd actually burnt funding somewhere in the order of $10 million and we we're running out of cash. And we continued to actually require further cash. We were going to actually produce still a loss in the current financial year, but moving forward, we we're going to start actually producing profits. Um, now, what was interesting here, even though it was actually a couple of years down the track and starting to actually produce real numbers with real client base and you could see the success of what it was, it still had a very limited value because of the actual continued investment required. And keeping in mind also that when a discounted cash flow works, um, if you actually put the, the um, present value of an outlay now is going to be far more than a similar return later on because of that discounting effect of what's coming through. And that's so, so all that continued investment now is going to absolutely um, destroy any value that's there, depending on how large those cash flows are. This is my, my um, uh, second uh, case study for myself, which was actually a little bit the opposite. This was actually one that hit the market and hit the market extremely well. And we've been operating when I saw it for about a year and a half. Um, it had been, this platform been um, established. Again, it was on a subscriber model. Essentially, it was one of those undie clubs. You'll see sort of underwear clubs, shaver clubs, shoe clubs. This was an undie club where you um, subscribed for a year at a time, and every month you actually receive a new pair of undies with a fancy label on it uh, or fancy design. Um, they did well from actually um, getting in with the skateboarders who, if you can imagine, I definitely can because I've got teenagers, where they actually try wearing their, their jeans halfway down their legs so you can actually see the actual tag on the undies. It became actually a little bit of a name that they, the, the skateboarders wanted to use. This business here, despite significant investment, that actually established their platform and now it was all about business growth. So the research and development had largely ceased despite only being operating for a year and a half and they were establishing their business. In this case here, again, with this kind of cash flow approach, um, the only real outlays moving forward were operational um, outlays as well as um, certain financing returns, so funder, funders being repaid but the actual value under this approach came out quite significant. And the biggest risk with that sort of business was, you know, there already were competitors in the market, but um, being a fashion type item, probably, you know, how long would it stay in fashion? Would it just suddenly not be cool for the skateboarders to wear anymore? That was, I think, the biggest risk that we were yeah. sort of taking into account in that one. And again, that's difficult for us as accountants to try to assess, you know, how many of these undies are going to be sold? At this stage, they had, I think their actual mailing list was something like 10 to 15,000 pairs of undies a year. Um, now, I would have at the outset said, you're not going to actually get that level of penetration in the marketplace. They did, and they were actually growing at an exponential rate. Um, it was a really interesting business to look at. So that's pretty well um, what we um, wanted to cover today, and our time's up. So thanks very much for joining us. Questions? Oh, questions. Sorry, yes. Now, we've got a fancy little um, button here that actually puts up questions. Anyone have any, any questions? The Berkus Method. We've got a request for um, the Berkus Method. Peter, do you want to expand at all on that, or if you, you've now covered that? Um, as I said, it basically just, um, there's various um, 
parameters that you measure against it compared to you know have have you got at what stage of the of the process are you so is it purely just an idea is it um an idea that has been turned into a prototype um it's really just, it's how far along the line are you and then um Berkus, who invented it gave some arbitrary values to things and basically uh, nothing was valued, I think, more than $2 million on his methodology. If you just had an idea, he'd say, well, maybe it's worth a couple hundred grand. If you had a working prototype, it was worth 500,000, et cetera. And if I was to have to take away from um, today's short session, and it has been a very short session, this is sort of, you could talk about this for days, um, but it would be, it's a case by case basis. You need to understand what's there and significant work needs to be put in not only around the actual forecasted information that's there, but particularly around the actual risk and what actually is going to affect this. Um, I'm not going to go through, this is where, you know, we, we do that, that bit of a sell, which I always hate. Um, from our point of view, we're in forensics. Um, if we can assist in any way, um, even if it's for queries you may have for actually the work you're doing, by all means, contact us. I believe the actual slides are going to be um, provided after this session. Um, and uh, from from Vincent's viewpoint, we're a full for service firm. So again, if there's anything we can actually help you with, um, by all means call. So thank you.